this session, which was originally titled, or the main title of it is, Here's How You Really Make Money From Personal Training. Possibly the most clickbaity session title of 2018. Uh, I want to point out that that wasn't my original choice, the session title. And so it just puts a little bit more pressure on me to offer something jaw-droppingly insightful and, and groundbreaking. Um, uh, and also, um, it's made a little bit harder by the fact that this is my first slide. Um, which is a little bit awkward um, when we're talking about personal training, but it will make more sense uh, as I go through the, uh, the presentation. You might also have noticed that my fellow speaker is not here. So unfortunately, Dependa Volhena from Fitness Hut in Portugal uh, had some visa issues and, and he's not able to join us today. Um, so that adds a little bit extra pressure for me because uh, I've only got 10 minutes worth of uh, material. So uh, I'll do some singing and dancing to, to fill the gaps. If you do have plenty of questions for me, that would be even better. Um, but I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll all get something useful out of, uh, out of today. Uh, so by way of a bit of background, for those of you that, uh, that don't know me, it's nice to see some, some familiar faces in the, in the audience, but for those of you that don't know, um, FutureFit Train, I'm head of PT at FutureFit Training, and a training provider, we've been in the industry for 25 years. We offer qualifications, training, ongoing support for fitness professionals through our three schools, personal training, nutrition, and Pilates. Uh, we've won the UK Active Training Provider of the Year title for the last two years running. 2016 and 2017. As I say, this is our 25th anniversary, 2018, so we're going for the hat-trick of wins at the end of this year. Fingers crossed for that one. Um, we are really, really passionate about raising the bar of education and training in the fitness industry. So one of our kind of key messages is about quality training. I'm sure a lot of you here today, whether you're personal trainers or, or operators, will recognize that as an industry, we want to be more professional, we want to be much higher quality to offer a better service to our clients and to our, to our customers. Uh, and you will probably be aware, if you are from the FutureFit, of our Raising the Bar report. So on a regular basis, we publish the, uh, the Raising the Bar report, which looks at all the skills gaps and key areas for improvement that are necessary in our workforce, our fitness workforce, to make sure we're fit for purpose. Uh, the next Raising the Bar report is actually released next week, which I'll touch on a bit later on. Um, but if you've uh, not seen that report, I highly recommend you have a look at it, look at the stats and the information provided within it. And that informs a lot of the changes that are going on in the industry at the moment in terms of upskilling PTs and what training and, and education is necessary to make sure we have a, a fit for purpose workforce. Uh, myself, I've been in the industry for 15 years. Uh, I started off as a gym instructor. I've been a personal trainer. I've been a tutor, writer, presenter, consultant. Um, so I've been around the block a few times. I've been a PT manager for a while, and I was responsible for recruiting and managing and uh, retaining PTs. Uh, and I have to be honest, I found that quite a challenging role. Uh, it certainly wasn't easy to find qualified PTs, hang on to them, and maintain um, uh, mentor them through a successful business. Uh, which again, sure, some of you may be able to, to relate to that. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that trainers coming into the industry are kind of not quite prepared, as prepared as they should be in order to, to develop a successful career. So as you'd expect from myself, uh, coming from a training provider, I think a lot of the challenges and the questions that we face as an industry boil back down to the correct training and education at the, at the point of qualification. Uh, so that's a point I will touch on a little bit later on. Um, there's two main points I want to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the, uh, some principles rather than specific methods and tools. So any of you expecting guaranteed six-figure uh, business plans, I'm afraid that's not what I can offer you today. So I'm going to be talking about some fundamental principles. And um, as I've got a little bit of extra time, I want to start off though with uh, something a bit different. Um, I want to talk about the fundamental drivers for success as a PT. So these are kind of very simple principles, but I think uh, we're, it's something that create a, a mindset shift, particularly new personal trainers coming into the industry who are perhaps um, wondering why they're struggling to, uh, to make a, a good go of it. So I th firstly think that to be a personal trainer, you have to be good at what you do. So that should go without saying. So you need to be good at getting clients results. That's through exercise coaching, through sound nutrition advice, through lifestyle management, through behavior change. We have to fundamentally be good at being a personal trainer. But being good at a personal trainer and being good at your profession doesn't mean that you can run a successful personal training business. Anyone seen, uh, hang on, I've got the, got, the wrong, got the wrong slide, good start. Everyone that's here read the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber? Okay, only a couple of you, interesting. 
So the E bit, my bike called Gerber, is a really interesting book. It was a game changer for me. Basically, the premise of the, the, the e myth is that just because you're good at a particular job doesn't mean you can run a business based on that job. This was a penny drop moment for me as a, as a PT. I realised I was good at helping clients, getting results for clients, but when it came to creating a successful business, earning more money, I needed to develop a whole new skill set around sales, around marketing, around systems. So as soon as I read that book, it was, as I say, it was a game changer for me. I can highly recommend you, you read it. There's now umpteen different versions of that book available um, for uh, all sorts of different careers now as well. So Michael's written versions for doctors, for lawyers, for physicians. Personal trainers as yet. Um, I'll be hopefully with him on that. I don't know. Um, but I can highly recommend reading that book as a as a a mindset shift for what you need to achieve to be a successful PT. So as I say, what we're going to look at today is some fundamental principles, not quick fixes. There's no step-by-step -step systems that will guarantee you success. There's no foolproof methods that will instantly turn you into a six-figure trainer overnight. I don't personally believe you can get a quick win or a shortcut to a successful PT business. It takes a long, long time. Um, it took me a couple of years to get up to the level where I thought I was comfortable in terms of my earnings, um, but I never once thought, this is too hard for me, I'm going to give up, it's not working. I knew it was going to be a long, hard process. The two fundamental principles I want to talk about, um, kind of, it's related to the, you might have heard the, um, the, the adage, teach a man a fish, uh, forgive a man a fish, you can feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish, you can feed him for a lifetime. So one head, one. So along similar lines, I think in terms of personal training, the question that we should be asking perhaps is not so much how do you make money as a personal trainer, but what skills do you need to make money as a personal trainer? If we can teach those skills to people, teach the principles to people, we've got far more likelihood of a long-term success. So principles for me are something that's not focused on as much as they should be in the fitness industry. We focus too much on these quick methods, the quick fixes, the shortcuts, the, the guaranteed steps. But if we taught the principles, people can figure out their own ways of doing things. So the two, the two main principles I'm going to talk about today, um, and I say we have got a little bit of extra time here. Because Vilhena is not here, uh, I will be hopefully answering a few more questions towards the end. Uh, Dupanda did, he did actually send me his uh, slideshow, all 52 slides of it. Um, so I didn't have a chance to, to learn all those yesterday. Um, but interestingly, of what he's, he was going to talk about supports what we're going to talk about. Uh, and it is a couple of uh, quotes, a couple of slides that he, uh, that he included that I'll try and remember to, to, uh, to reference as we go through. Um, so the first couple of principles I'm going to talk about. Sell the client what they actually want. Very, very basic marketing and sales principle. We can more closely match what the client wants with what you are offering. Intuitively, you're going to sell more of it. Now, it's a very simple marketing sales concept, but it's something I don't think we do particularly well as an industry. And the reason for that is that it's only recently we've started to truly understand what personal training is or what it can be, what it could be for our clients. And if our trainers don't understand, if we don't understand what we're offering, our clients have got no chance. But if we can work on that, if we can make sure we've closely matched that, that offering of what they want, we're going to sell more. And the second thing we talk about is uh, quality PT leading to better PT retention. So this is best illustrated by a quote that I read in a magazine a few weeks ago. Um, there was a small studio owner who was asked the question, how important is personal training or how are personal trainers to your business? And his answer was very, very interesting. He said, personal trainers are very, very important to my business because they're the main source of income. And I thought that's quite interesting. I'm not saying that personal training shouldn't be a direct revenue stream um, as an operator, but I think to focus on it as the primary source of revenue is potentially missing a, missing a trick. I think if we can look at retaining members using PT as a retention tool, that has got huge potential for increasing that bottom line. Now again, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, so. Back to this, uh, this slide, no one actually wants personal training. So this is a drum that I've been banging for a long time now. I mention it to, to students on our courses, which often takes them by surprise. Um, but the reason for it is that I think we have, as an industry, we have confused our profession, our trade, personal training, with what clients actually buy from us. So I'm going to use a, an analogy. I, I like using my analogies. Um, if you go into a, a, a car garage, because you need some work to do on your car, and you go to the mechanic and you say, right, I need new brake pads, I need new brake discs, and I need a new set of tires. What are your labor rates? And the mechanic says, oh, we charge 60 pounds an hour. 
do you say to that mechanic, great, um, I'm going to pay you for three hours then, I'll pay you uh, 180 quid for three hours to do some mechanics on my car. That's not what we do. What we say is, I need some new brake pads, new brake discs, new tyres. How much will that cost? We basically we ask, what is the cost of the result that I want? And it should be the same with personal training. But we don't do that. We ask, how much is personal training? How much is your profession? Yeah, so that, does that make sense to people? And, that's, and it's no wonder that personal training clients then get confused, because they go along with this. They will ask us, how much is personal training? We tell them, 40 pounds an hour, 50 pounds an hour. And they go, oh, right, OK. And then we get surprised when they walk out the door and say, oh, it's too expensive, I'm going to think about it, it's not for me right now. But it's because they've asked the wrong question, and we've primed them to ask the wrong question. They've just asked us, how much is your profession? How much does it cost you to do your job? Not, what is the cost of the result that I actually want? Okay? Um, so I think part of the problem is that we're selling sessions. We've been selling time. We sell 10 sessions for the price of eight. We sell, buy 10 sessions, get two free. It's 40 pounds an hour, it's 50 pounds an hour. But time is the, the scarcest resource of the 21st century. People don't have a lot of it. They've only got loads of spare time, loads of time they just don't know what to do with. And our clients are the same. So they're not going to pay us to take more of something they don't have a lot of already. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, a key point that I think is a barrier to, to selling PT. If you're asking them to buy time that they don't have a lot of anyway, it's not going to be very successful. So what do they buy if they're not going to buy time? Uh, I'm going to use a, a different analogy this time. You probably didn't expect to see a picture of a drill uh, when you sat down this morning. Um, but this is a really, really uh, key one for me that, talk, that really hammers in this, this point that people don't buy the process, they don't buy the profession that we do, they buy an outcome. But in our particular world, there's more to it than that. It's not just about the particular outcome. So a few weeks ago over Easter, I did the classic British thing. I did some, uh, some DIY or butchery, as my wife called it, at home. Uh, and to do that, I needed to buy a drill. Now, why would you buy a drill from a DIY store? Is it because you want a drill? Or is it because you want a hole? Okay, do you want the outcome? Digging a little bit deeper, do I, did I want a hole in my wall? Or actually, did I want the ability to hang up a little picture of my little boy that makes me smile every time I walk past it? Okay, again, you probably won't expect to see that as well either. Um, that is my little boy, by the way, eating an ice cream, wearing a fine and sand costume. Uh, and for those of you that are wondering, yes, he is wearing nail varnish. <laughs> it's 2018, what can I say? Um, but that uh, guy wanted to hang up that picture that makes me smile. I wanted to feel good. So what people are looking for really is not the process, not the, the system, not the, not the time they spend with you. They're looking for a result or a solution to a specific problem. Ultimately, they want to feel good, whether that's emotional well-being, physical well-being, whatever it is, they want, they want change for the better. And that essentially is what you are selling to your clients. Okay. So how do we do that? We need to somehow package it up. We need to present the offering, present the service and the product that we have in a way that matches the wants and needs of that particular customer. Again, this is where I think we have uh, had a bit of a disconnect over the, over the years. Difficult to go into too much detail with this right now, um, even though I do have all this extra time. I didn't have enough time to, uh, to plan out some extra slides. But this next one will hopefully illustrate the point in a, in a succinct way in terms of how we present our services as PTs. So if you just have a look at those two offerings on the left and the right there, and think about which one would be more appealing to you as a client, particularly if you are in the market of looking for, or if you're a client that is looking for weight loss or for, for fat loss. Okay. On the left, we've got your typical offering that we see in and on social media, on posters, adverts, we're offering time in exchange for money. Okay? So it's a classic 12 sessions price of 10. We'll get you some nutrition advice, we'll get you some motivation, and um, I'll tailor the program. Um, if the program's not tailored, that, that should be a given anyway. Um, that's a kind of a classic offering that we see in gyms. Whereas on the right hand side, you've got a much more targeted package that's aimed at the goal or the desired outcome of a, of a client. Now in that list of things that we've got in there, things like uh, weekly coach workouts, master classes, uh, tracking, ebooks, the actual cost of delivery of that package on the right is probably no different to one on the left. Okay? It still might consist of 12 one-hour sessions with a client. 
Okay, but it's the way it's presented and it's the added value that is presented to the client. So for example, the third bullet point down on the right there, a learn to lift weight training masterclass. That's essentially one hour with you as a PT training your client how to use weights. But a one hour PT session versus a learn to lift weight training masterclass, which one has more appeal? So I believe that when you design packages like this, you get a perceived higher value. So the client will look at the package on the right and see that as being much more valuable. Now that means not only are they more willing to pay for it, but it means that it's, you can charge more for it as well. Both of those things will lead to more revenue for no extra work other than a bit of planning, a bit of preparation to put that package together. Okay? So we see, we see this principle being put into practice quite, quite a lot in the industry. Um, so these are sort of, sort of, sort of common um, packages that you might see um, so you offered. The, whether they're celebrity endorsed or not, they're all based pretty much on the same principles. So I've chosen fat loss and body transformation just because it's the most popular market. But all of these principles, uh, sorry, all of these packages, they'll be based on the same concept of, for example, creating a calorie deficit, introducing more exercise into somebody's daily life, making them more physically active. All the same thing, just the way it's presented. So it might first seem like I'm kind of endorsing these kind of quick fixes and these fads that I, I argued against earlier on, but you can do this in an ethical way. You're all qualified PTs or you, you work with qualified PTs, you've got the technical knowledge in terms of the nutrition advice, the training, the lifestyle management. This is just purely a way the way you package that up and you offer it to, to clients. Okay? Have you working on that so far? I want to see the difference between offering basically your time for money versus offering a solution focused package. Okay. So that's my first kind of overall point. We'll come back to some questions on that a little bit later on. Um, second point I want to talk about is, uh, as an operator, how we make more money. So a quick show of hands, how many of you are responsible for recruitment and management of PTs? Okay. So this is, this is, this is about as controversial as I'm going to get today. Kind of, I, I play it very, very safe. Um, but hopefully this will be a, kind of a, again, another penny drop moment that might, uh, might help change the way we offer PT in our businesses. So there's two common models for generating revenue from PT that we see in the industry currently, and I call them direct methods. So the first one is where the PT pays a license fee or pays a rent to the, back to the gym. And the second model might be where you have an employed model for PTs, you pay a salary for PT, but the gym member pays a fee for the PT to the gym. The revenue comes directly from the, the member. Um, both valid methods, um, both current models that are used widely within the industry by different operators and different employers to varying levels of success, um, and they can say they can work very well, but I think we're probably missing out on a, a, a key focus here that works in tandem with these two models. We haven't really focused too much on the idea of retaining members and the impact that has on our client retention. Hopefully I won't need to argue, or wouldn't need to argue too much with uh, you that if you can retain a member for an extra month, an extra two months, an extra three months, the impact that has on your bottom line is pretty significant. Okay, anybody want to argue with that one? Okay, Hope. I'm glad about that, I've had a comeback. <laughs> um, so if we can demonstrate that retaining members is possible or it can be increased through personal training and a better personal training service, then we have a direct, uh, a direct reason to focus on PT as a, as a retention tool. And it just so happens there are stats out there that support that. So a few years ago, Dr. Melvin Hilsden did the TRP 10,000 study, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, you, you've searched that online, there's loads of information in healthcare management in particular. It was basically a survey done on 10,000 gym members analysing their behaviour across a range of different uh, measures. But one of the things that they found was that gym members who have regular personal training are 30% less likely to cancel their gym membership than people who don't have personal training sessions. And it's worth noting that the definition of regular PT was a gym member that's had at least four sessions of PT in the previous three months. Okay? At least four sessions of PT in the previous three months. So that shows you just how little it takes to have a significant impact on member retention. The impact that will then have on, uh, on, on revenue generation is obviously down to your individual businesses and your individual models, but uh, that's why I haven't got any figures on that. But it can have a significant impact. 
What we do have is a, a case study from our friends at Your Personal Training. So FutureFit work with your PT, who are our PT management company, very closely. And we uh, have 800 PTs. They work with 54 different leisure operators at the time of putting this presentation together. Um, and they were very kindly shared some statistics with us based on, um, based on the, the findings they've had in terms of impact on gym member retention through personal training. So through surveying all the, the gym members from their current uh, operator clients and their PTs, they have found that personal training extends the member length of stay to 18 months across more than two thirds of their membership base. And in one particular case, that's up from months. So essentially, personal training has doubled the member length of stay. For now the impact, again, that that has on revenue is absolutely massive. One of the keys to this, obviously, is personal training. Uh, well, having a quality personal training service. We basically need our trainers to do a good job at effectively helping members. And to do that, we need correct training, better education, to make sure the PTs are able to do their job effectively and to retain those clients. Your PT are on the right lines there. So we hear some scary statistics in the industry about retention rates of PTs, but in terms of your, your personal training, their licensee average length of stay, just under two years, and their attrition rate has reduced massively over the last couple of years as well. So they must be doing something right. Um, how do they do that? How can you as operators do something similar? Um, well, I think it comes down to two or three factors. One is certainly correct recruitment strategies, making sure you're taking on personal trainers that show promise and potential, um, some that have uh, the ambition and also have the, the underpinning knowledge. That's certainly quite crucial. But I also think ongoing training support is critical. So the, the table on the right there is taken from the most recent Raise in the Bar report that Future released, and that shows the key skills gaps that we found from uh, operators in terms of their workforces. Um, I'm sure most of you would agree with the stats on the right-hand side there in terms of the skills that personal trainers are, are missing to be successful. Uh, and the reason why you probably will agree with it is because it's you guys have told us it. This, this raising the bar stats are taken from consultation with employers and stakeholders. So we've got things like social skills, behavior change skills, commercial acumen, counseling skills, uh, tech tracking. These are the things that we know that if trainers are better at doing, they can offer a better service to their clients and they can retain clients much more effectively. Okay? So the responsibility for doing this lies uh, threefold, I think. So yes, certainly individual trainers have got the responsibility to continually educate themselves, keep themselves updated, making sure they're learning what they need to, to learn, and be good at being good at what they do. Secondly, I think training providers like ourselves have got a responsibility to make sure our qualifications are fit for purpose and we are delivering the skills and the knowledge that get people prepared for successful careers as PTs. But also I think operators, you guys, have got a vested interest in making sure trainers are upskilled and have those correct skills and knowledge. So a lot of trainers come into the industry and they work in, um, in settings where they, they have to rely on themselves to upskill and continue their professional journey. Which again, I say is that's, that's valid to an extent. But I think as operators, for all the reasons we've talked about, they have an interest, they should have an interest in making sure your client, your trainers are upskilled to the best of their ability because the impact that can then have on member retention. So in the nutshell, here's how you really make money from personal training from my point of view. We need to sell the client what they actually want and we need to increase member retention with quality PT. So as PTs, we need to be really, really good at what we do, but we also need to be really, really good at business skills, sales and marketing in particular. We can hang on to those members, build successful careers and because a successful career goes hand in hand with making more money. So that is, uh, that is my bit. Um, I will be around afterwards if anyone wants to um, have any talks, uh, any chat to person. If you've got any questions for me on social media, that's me at the top there, and that's all our future bit social media handles as well. I um, hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, so guys, thank you very much.